Welcome to Uban Rajatani and the International Relations Office as we present some tips and guides for you to do well on the IELTS or uh, International English Language Testing System. This is our third segment on writing. Writing is considered the most difficult part of this IELTS exam. You'll want to form a thorough analysis of the items beforehand so that you're ready to go to write. Let's take a look at some more elements of this. You want to divide your time smartly. 20 minutes for the first task of writing, 40 minutes for the second. This one is much more difficult and is valued more highly on scoring the exam. You'll need to write over 150 words for the first section and over 250 for task two, and the key word is over. Write more than that and get an idea how long that is for you when writing it out on paper. You'll want to avoid repeating the same words, ideas, phrases, and of course, you'll need a conclusion uh, and we'll look at the details of what you'll want to write shortly. Be precise with relevant answers, avoid writing long paragraphs, and of course, it's generally preferred you use the active voice in writing. Make sure you leave enough time to proofread thoroughly and revise it. Finally, make sure you write in block letters. If the evaluator can't read what you've written, you won't get points for that. So this writing exam will take you 60 minutes for two big sections, well, one small and one larger section. In the first task, you'll be presented with a graph, a chart, or a diagram, and be asked to explain it. The second job in this part of the test will be to write an essay in response to a point of view or an argument or some other problem. And you'll want to write in a formal style, of course. So here are the official band descriptors. What they're looking for at IELTS for a seven, at least, which is what most of you are going to want to get on this test. Let's take a close look at the details. For band seven, we'll see in task response, addresses all parts of the task, presents a clear position throughout the response, presents, extends, and supports main ideas, but there may be a tendency to overgeneralize and or supporting ideas may lack focus. In the area of coherence and cohesion, for number seven, logically organizes information and ideas. There is a clear progression throughout. Uses a range of cohesive devices appropriately, although there may be some under or over use of these. Presents a clear central topic within each paragraph. For lexical resources, uses a sufficient range of vocabulary to allow some flexibility and precision uses less common lexical terms with some awareness of style and co-location, may produce occasional errors in word choice, spelling, and or word formation, uses a variety of complex structures for grammatical range and accuracy, produces frequent error-free sentences, has a good control of grammar, and punctuation, but may make some errors. So in this segment of our video explanation of the IELTS, we'll try to unpack some of these items in band seven. Of course, a recent exam topic and one that seems to pop up frequently uh, are issues concerning the environment. For example, if we ask people do not recycle waste, what are the reasons what can be done to solve this problem? This has been a common topic for many years. You'll want to provide two reasons and two solutions. For example, lack of awareness and inconvenience. Now we need a solution for each of these. 
conduct an awareness campaign and make it easier. Those would be two things you could do as reasons to and solutions to and then write in a detailed formal manner about your reasons and solutions. And here again are the four categories for band seven, for all the bands in fact. So what will you do to prepare? We recommend you write a paragraph each day to practice your writing. The IELTS exam is not something you can cram for in three days before the test, like you might have gotten away with in some classes. It is ongoing for listening, speaking, and reading and writing. Do each every day, especially the month before the test. One thing that really helps even me, a native speaker, is the Grammarly app. You can download it for free on your phone, you can use it on your computer, and it is a grammar teacher. It will tell you when something's wrong and suggest the correction. If you pay money to Grammarly, they will give you even more writing tips, but the free application even helps me make uh, better Facebook posts and the like. So be familiar with the test and don't be surprised on test day. You're going to see pie charts, bar graphs, uh, and line graphs and need to explain those in written form. And whatever you do, don't memorize an essay beforehand. Be sure you tailor your write, written work to the specific questions they're asking on the test. So while you won't want to memorize a whole essay, you will want to have an idea bank running. For example, ideas about the environment, recycling, and all this are common topics uh, for the IELTS exam. So keep those running in your mind as you think about the kind of topics they may ask you about have specialized vocabulary and ideas in mind before you go to the test without memorizing anything. Perhaps you have seen the hamburger image. Of course, this is, explains what most people do know. Written work needs to have an introduction, a body with at least two paragraphs, and a conclusion. And we'll look at the details of each of those just shortly. So of course, in the introduction, you're going to want to state specifically what you're going to talk about in your written work. And try to present one overarching theme in your introduction. The body of your written work, your essay, uh, will need supporting ideas, perhaps three, give reasons and evidence with details. Your conclusion is going to sum up what you've already written and offer an appeal for why what you've written is persuasive and should be accepted by the reader. So let's dive into the introduction. The introduction should identify the specific topic, then define limit and narrow it down to one specific issue. It should provide relevant background information. It should identify and explain complications found within the topic. And a thesis statement should establish the direction of study. And finally, point the audience towards your conclusion. And now for some don'ts for introductions. Do not provide a vague generality or truth. For example, throughout human history or in today's world, do not reference the essay's title. This is a big problem. The book is about the history of the guitar. Do not start by using a dictionary definition. According to Webster's, don't begin with an apology. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think, I don't know how much I know about this. Don't begin with a flat announcement. The purpose of this essay is, in this essay I will. 
So try to dive right into your essay, but without these clumsy filler statements, the don'ts. So here's one of our YouTube stars, Asia, who got a nine on this exam, and she shares uh, on the internet her own introduction. Let's take a look. The question is, in many countries, people who do not recycle waste materials such as bottles and newspapers, what are the reasons for this? What could be done to solve this problem? And her introduction is this. Recycling materials such as glass, plastic, and cartons is an important practice that helps to reduce our impact on the environment. Many people across the world, however, do not recycle their waste and send everything to landfill. This essay will discuss why this might be the case and how this problem can be alleviated. So you can see she's offered a summary of what she's going to talk about and went directly into that and is pointing already to her conclusion, how these problems might be alleviated. And that's what she'll be suggesting in the body of her essay and summing it up in the conclusion. So your second longer task could take about 40 minutes and address a serious social problem or something relevant to academia or education. Be sure to address all parts of the essay question. Here is a sample question. Living in a country where you have to speak a foreign language can cause serious social problems as well as practical problems. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Give reasons for your answer and include any relevant examples from your own knowledge or experience. So be sure to address all aspects of those topics. Include your own knowledge and experience and be sure you've written over 250 words in block letters. So let's take a look at another sample one question dealing with bars, graphs, charts, or diagrams that you will need to write about and explain. The chart below shows the number of men and women in further education in Britain in three periods and whether they were studying full-time or part-time. Summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. We can see full-time education, part-time education, and males and females acknowledged in this graph, as well as the numbers in thousands in higher education. So now let's take a look at what this person wrote and what the examiner said about it. The test taker wrote this is a bar chart of the number of men and women in further education in three periods. In 1970, most of the men were studying part-time, but from 1980, studying part-time was decreased and studying full-time was increased. And in 1990, it was twice as many students as in 1970. On the other hand, women studying full-time were increased and not only full-time, part-time also were increased. In 1990, studying full-time was three times as many students as in 1970. If compare men and women, as you see, in 1970, men were studying more than women full-time or part-time, but it changed from 1980 and then. In 1990, women were studying part-time more than men and studying full-time was same number. It shows you women have a high education now. So there are some problems with the writing here. This was not a nine score, but it was a good solid answer. Let's see what the evaluator had to say about this essay. The length of the answer is just acceptable. There is a, there is a good attempt to describe the overall trends but the content would have been greatly improved if the candidate had included some reference to the figures given on the graph. Without these, the reader is lacking some important information. 
The answer is quite difficult to follow, and there are some punctuation errors that cause confusion. The structures are fairly simple, and efforts to produce more complex sentences are not successful. And so do please take a longer look at this on the PowerPoint or in this video uh, to see the specific comments the evaluator had in the four categories of task achievement, coherence and cohesion, lexical resources, and finally, uh, the task response. So please full screen this slide and take a look in more detail uh, at the criteria for the four categories of uh, task achievement, coherence and cohesion, lexical resources, and grammatical accuracy, the four big categories on which they will score you for the writing part of the exam. So here's a sample question from part two, the more difficult section for which you'll want to spend perhaps 40 minutes. Let's take a look. Write about the following topic. The first car appeared on British roads in 1888. By the year 2000, there may be as many as 29 million vehicles on British roads. Alternative forms of transportation should be encouraged and international laws introduced to control car ownership and use. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Give reasons for your answer and include any relevant examples from your knowledge or experience. Write at least 250 words. So the key word here is your knowledge and experience. What is your knowledge and experience of traffic, traffic jams, pollution, Think in the idea bank all the issues involved with too many cars on the road from traffic fatalities and pollution uh, to waste of resources. Here you can see sample writing sheets that you'll be receiving on the day of the test. So here again is a, a test taker's example of an essay. We won't read the whole essay by the test taker, but let's take a look at the examiner's comments. The candidate has made a good attempt to describe the graphs looking at global trends and more detailed figures. There is, however, some information missing, and the information is inaccurate in minor areas. The answer flows quite smoothly, although connectives are overused or inappropriate and some of the points do not link up well. The grammatical accuracy is quite good, and the language is used to describe the trends is well handled. However, there are problems with expression and the appropriate choice of words. And while there is good structural control, the complexity and variation in the sentences are limited. So this is a score for a band six student which is perhaps you, or perhaps you're an eight or a nine, we don't know. But band six is what we really need to hit to, for most all applications. And here's another section two writing sample. Let's take a look again at what did the examiner have to say. For a band six student, the examiner said, although the script contains some good arguments, these are presented using poor structures and the answer is not very coherent. The candidate has a clear point of view, but not all of the supporting arguments are linked together well, and sometimes ideas are left unfinished. There is quite a lot of relevant vocabulary, but this is not used skillfully, and sentences often have words missing or lapse into different styles. The answer is spoiled by grammatical errors and poor expression. So take a look at this essay in your leisure time and try to avoid the pitfalls the examiner has noted. So to answer these questions, let's look at some key points, shall we? You want to make sure the answer is relevant to the question. So you want your examples and ideas to focus specifically on the topic and do not generalize too much. This is a weakness for many students. 
you need specifics. Make sure your ideas are directly related to the question and use examples and ideas that you're familiar with and that relate to the topic. Extend your answer to include a number of ideas that will support the question. And again, don't include irrelevant information or overgeneralize or produce a memorized essay, something you did in advance of the exam. So a big don't, don't produce too short of an essay. Make sure you exceed the 150 and 250 word minimums and make sure your introduction tells the examiner what you're going to say and what you have already said for your conclusion. So another hot tip, be sure to use linking phrases to organize your essay logically with a logical progression from step to step to step. Let's take a look. We can see linking words in English. So if you're asked to present both views on an issue, then state your opinion at the beginning and then move on to present both views and spend about as much time on your view as an opponent or other person's view. Then come back to your own opinion and conclude the essay. And among these linking words, let's look for emphasis, undoubtedly, indeed, obviously, especially, clearly, importantly, and linking words of addition, furthermore, as well as that, besides, in addition, moreover, contrasts, unlike, nevertheless, on the other hand, order, firstly, order, finally, previously, following, before, subsequently, last but not least. And so let's look at some important do's along with the don'ts. So now let's look at some do's in addition to the don'ts. Do use a range of linking words and phrases, but don't overuse them. Do use adverbial phrases rather than single basic linkers. Do use referencing and substitution to avoid repetition. Do use punctuation to make your writing coherent. And make sure your ideas are sequenced logically and that they're easy to follow. And use a separate paragraph for the introduction and the conclusion and one paragraph for each idea or topic error. And you're going to want to have at least two body paragraphs, possibly three. It's common to have an introduction, three points to make, summing it all up with the fifth paragraph as a conclusion. And let's look at some don'ts again. So don't overuse basic linking words like firstly. Instead, try the first reason for, or the primary reason for this is even better. Start each sentence with a link. Some people believe, however, that individuals must also take responsibility for the environment, or I believe, on the other hand, that individuals do have a responsibility. Use, don't use numbers, symbols, or abbreviations. So if it's a single number, you'll want to write out the word one or two, T-W-O-O-N-E. Don't use headings or subheadings or underline words or phrases. Never use a one sentence paragraph and start every sentence with a linking device. So you're gonna want to organize your writing into paragraphs and then we can use the PEEL acronym to remember how we should do that the most effectively. Point, introduce your topic or topic sentence. Example, what example supports your point? Explain why this evidence supports your point. Link, 
a transition to the next topic or paragraph. So you must have enough paragraphs to show you have a structured, thorough response to the question with details logically organized. So do, again, use paragraphs as we said. Make sure you leave a space between each paragraph so that it's very clear that you have a paragraph. So now the prospect of co-location is a tricky one. Let's take a look at what's involved with that. And you'll want to be aware of this as you're writing your essay. Co-location involves using less common vocabulary and spelling it correctly. In the band descriptors we looked at, a band eight writer skillfully uses uncommon lexical terms. When we learn a language, we use common and uncommon terms. Uncommon terms are those we use to discuss specific topics or idiomatic language and phrasal verbs. Old-fashioned words or words not used in everyday speech should not be used. If you choose a synonym, make sure the meaning is the same. So adolescent and teenager have close meaning and can be used interchangeably, but toddler and baby have a quite different meaning. Collocation is mentioned, and this is the knowledge of what words go together with what other words and which are suitable to use for different topics. So let's take a look, common collocation in English. And we have several verbs in our chart here. Keep, keep quiet, keep control. Or with go, go bankrupt, go mad, go insane. Give a hand, give a ride. Use idioms only if you're sure you know the meaning because your evaluator will know if you use them correctly or not. So another set of do's, do use precise words, words that you understand that are used in everyday language and use collocation and phrasal verbs when you can and avoid idioms that you're not sure of. And don't clearly make spelling mistakes or typos don't switch British and American spellings. Use one or the other. They're both okay. Don't use a word if you can't spell it or don't understand it. And don't use reductions like gonna or gimme or generic terms like this stuff or those things or old fashioned phrases like my lands. And don't use even contractions like can't or didn't. For a formal essay like this, you're going to want to say cannot and do not. It's more polite and formal. So don't use memorized language, much less an entire essay memorized. Your evaluator will know what you did and that you're not thinking off the cuff and spontaneously and from your own knowledge of English writing. So some phrases like love is blind off the top of my head. A friend in need is a friend indeed. And then we can look at some good and bad uh, ways of phrasing. Nowadays is bad. In recent times or recently is much better. Can't is bad, but cannot is good. And so forth. So try to put, keep these in your mind as you're going about uh, preparing for the exam. And use a wide variety of complex sentence structure to ace out the grammatical and lexical resources and accuracy section of this test. If you're going for a band eight, they'll want you to show a wide range of structures accurately to present your ideas and opinion. Demonstrate to that examiner you can use a wide range of structures and, of course, make sure your, er your sentences are error-free and mix up complex and simple sentences. Your complex sentences 
don't need to be long and complicated, and they should not be. Punctuation should be accurate. And of course, with grammar, let's look at some common errors. Relative clauses. A common error is using the pronoun incorrectly. Who, that, or which. Conditional clauses. Choosing the wrong tense for the clause. For example, type zero and type one, two, and three conditional sentences. Present or perfect or past perfect. Getting the wrong tense is a common error. And of course, a big one, articles. Using a, an, or the incorrectly, or not using them. So take a look at these things. You probably know these things already, but make sure you get this all in your head as you prepare for this exam. So for a band eight, let's take a look at the steps to take. Even if you're wanting a six, aim for an eight. Maybe you'll end up with a seven. Did you answer all parts of the question sufficiently? Are all your ideas and support directly relevant to the question? Did you avoid overgeneralizing the topic? Does the examiner know exactly what you think? And do you present this position clearly for the whole essay? Did you support your ideas with clear examples and not vague research and survey results? And finally, and importantly, did you write over 250 words? On the checklist for, for coherence and cohesion, can the examiner follow your ideas easily from the beginning of your essay to the end? Does it progress clearly? Introduction, two or three main ideas with examples and details, followed by a conclusion that summarizes your points and what you said. Did you use a range of linking words and phrases and avoid repetition and starting every sentence with a linking device? For example, firstly, secondly, and thirdly, please avoid these. And did you use referencing in sufficient paragraphs? Did you use one paragraph to develop each idea? Is there a clear introduction and concluding paragraph? So there's the second of our four categories where they will judge your writing, coherence and cohesion. So with lexical resources, we're looking for vocabulary, spelling errors, and range of expression. Did you use a range of vocabulary that is on topic? Did you use precise vocabulary choices and co-location as we discussed and appropriate uncommon words like cultural diversity, for example? Check for spelling mistakes and typos and you'll need the correct form of the word for adverbs, nouns, adjectives, and verbs. So lexical resources is something you can check rather readily not as difficult as the other areas in the band descriptor. Grammatical range and accuracy, I suspect most of you know what these are all about. Did you have simple and complex structures presented accurately? Did you use a range of structures, conditional, present perfect, relative clauses, modal verbs? Did you avoid long complicated sentences and are your sentences error-free and punctuated correctly? Capital letters, of course, and proper nouns need to be capitalized. And then be careful with commas and periods. So keep all these things in mind as you're writing and be sure to write every day and go online, please. We encourage you to use the resources we use to prepare these videos. So if you go to these resources, you will find more than all you need to keep practice, practice, practicing. And write every day one paragraph and you'll do well, especially if you're also reading 30 minutes a day, practicing shadowing exercises for the speaking aspect of this test, 
and listening to a TV show every night. You have to soak your brain in English. Chokti tukon pomwangwa kun jami samrep. 